I think that the first speaker we have lined up is going to offer a particularly interesting and potentially provocative take on the Belt and Road. He is Martin Jakes, the author of an extremely successful book called When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World, and the Birth of a New Global Order. It was published in 2009, and since then it's been translated into 15 languages, it's sold over 400,000 copies, and his TED Talk on how to understand China has over two million views. He's a senior fellow at the University of Cambridge and also a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing and Fudan University in Shanghai. So without any further ado, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Martin to the stage. I'm going to that up. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Julian. Um, okay, uh, 2013, uh, Xi Jinping made a speech in Astana in Kazakhstan uh, about the uh, uh, new Silk Road, um, land-based, and in the following year he made a speech uh, in Indonesia uh, about the maritime uh, Silk Road. Now essentially this was building on already what China had been doing for over a decade with the going out strategy, uh, which was China's turn to the world after 20 years where basically it had concentrated on its domestic uh, development. Um, of course, when he introduced the idea, it evoked immediately uh, the history of the Silk Route. And uh, this uh, is highly evocative. You can see that in the way it's written about now in all sorts of different uh, ways. Um, but this, of course, was a project of its time, a very different time, uh, and hugely ambitious. Um, uh, it is difficult to think of any other country that could come up with something like Belt and Road. I mean, this lies in the tri Chinese tradition of... Uh, uh, of great projects, uh, you know, the Grand Canal, um, the Great Wall, uh, and so on. Now, initially, uh, uh, when it was put out, as it were, as an idea, and it was an idea, it was a concept initially. In fact, it's never really beyond the point moved uh, beyond that. Uh, it's not a plan. Um, and so it was sort of presented uh, as a possibility as a, uh, for, uh, for the Eurasian landmass, all the countries on the Eurasian landmass. And uh, <clears throat> there was, um, uh, especially uh, across the Asian side, uh, uh, Central Asia uh, and uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, a great deal of discussion about it. And then the project began to grow because essentially, unlike Marshall Aid Plan, which was... Uh, I suppose, in a sense, a predecessor, but much smaller. In today's values, uh, the Belt and Road uh, uh, idea is 12 times uh, that the size uh, of the, um, of the, of the, of the um, uh, Belt and Road initiative. Uh, and it was put out for uh, a proposal, and uh, it's, here we are. Uh, and uh, uh, it's grown a lot since the idea was first uh, formulated in 2014 and 2015. Uh, and so rather than just being, as it were, one route, uh, well, first of all, let's start with the simple one. Here is the, the maritime route, which takes you to the east of Africa and then up and eventually uh, to Europe, with uh, Greece being one of the important stocking points, the P Paris uh, port. And then there are six elements now uh, to Belt and Road. And this, I think, is a product of the way in which other countries have shaped it, particularly, for example, Russia's intervention or increasingly Turkey's uh, interest uh, in it. So you've got, uh, you've got this route, for example, which is the China-Mongolia-Russian uh, leg. Here you've got uh, the uh, Southeast Asia uh, leg, if you like. Here you have what's called BCIM, Bangladesh, uh, 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 Myanmar, uh, India, and China route. Um, 
And then here you've got the, Parki the Ch what's called CPEC, the China-Pakistan uh, Economic Corridor. Then you've got the big uh, wave through. This is sort of more like an energy route. This route is uh, to, uh, to Europe, uh, the, 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 the Eurasian land bridge. So you've got, it's, you, you see how much uh, the proposal has grown. It's got, uh, it's claimed, I don't know what the, whether the figures are, how much we can uh, believe the figures, but uh, uh, there are 900 projects so far um, and about $50 um, billion dollars. Uh, has been uh, spent uh, on uh, the project. Now, uh, and of course, I should add that the Middle East has become increasingly important in relationship to the discussion. And uh, the, the two roads actually join, uh, the maritime and the land-based routes join uh, in, uh, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, increasingly, over the last few years, the UAE in particular has become... Uh, more closely connected to these developments, and is and China is its second biggest uh, trading partner. Now, where does the idea come from? What, you know, what are the Chinese thinking of when they present something like this? Well, I think the best way to think about it, this is that China, reflecting on its own extraordinary and unprecedented and probably never to be repeated transformation, um, thought well. How did we do it? We did it essentially through extremely large-scale investment led by the state, uh, crucially in infrastructure, which produced this extremely rapid, rapid economic growth. Now, we're not a model because we're so different from other countries, but surely some of those lessons can be uh, applicable uh, to the Eurasian landmass. And so the idea was... Uh, that, um, that especially the Asian part of the Eurasian landmass, where, where many of the countries are, uh, are poor, um, uh, that perhaps the, the Eurasian landmass can be transformed in the same way that China has been transformed uh, by uh, this kind of approach. And I think that if we, if we, to understand China, one of the key words I think you have to understand we have to uh, uh, grasp, is development. China is, in our time, the great exponent of development. By development, I mean development for the developing world. China is the master of this experience and, uh, and is obviously in a very different position to the United States or Europe and so on because as rich countries, as developed countries, they don't have the same affinity with it, they don't have the same experience of it, China does. So if there was one country that was going to be able to take this initiative, it was China, because China has this experience, because China has the vision, China has the money, and also think of China not just as a country, but as a continent, not just as a continent, but in my view, as a sub-global system in its own right. One-fifth of the world's population, huge landmass, and so on. So... Uh, uh, so this is where uh, we are. Now, my th the third point I want to make uh, is um, uh, the impact that the, uh, the Belt and Road is likely to have. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, well, I don't know how successful it's going to be. Uh, it's, it's a very long-term program. Don't measure it in five years or ten years. I think, you know, in a minute, several decades, maybe 50 years, something like that, because we're talking about a huge, uh, a huge project. Um, but if it's even half successful, uh, it is going to transform not just the Eurasian landmass, it's going to transform the world as we know it. Now, let me draw your attention at this point to this map here. The center, where is the center of the global economy? Well, this is from Danny Kwa, who's now at uh, Lee Kuan Yew School, but it was LSE. And uh, in 1980, Danny Kwa estimated that the center of the global economy was here, in the Eastern Atlantic, where you'd expect it to be. It was essentially, the global economy was essentially a transatlantic economy. And then slowly it's been moving. 
uh, like here. And at this point, it is somewhere around here. So actually, not too far away from where we are now. Uh, uh, and by 2050, he estimates that it'll be on the Sino-Indian border. In other words, what we're witnessing is the shift of the globe, center of the global economy from here to the Eurasian landmass. This is going to be the engine of global development. This is going to be the center of the global economy. It's also, it follows, in time, will be the center, as it were, of the global polity. Um, and so this is an extraordinary uh, uh, shift uh, that, in some degree, I mean, I think this is taking place, quite frankly, anyway. The question is, the speed, the, the, the speed will be accelerated by the success or otherwise uh, of the Eurasian, uh, of, the, of, of BRI. Um, and it's worthwhile at this point also uh, uh, remembering that, you know, that where we are with the state of the global economy. I mean, these figures are from Huang, um, uh, uh, Huang, uh, uh, Huang Gong at uh, Tsinghua University. Um, but there are lots of figures uh, uh, that are similar. This is uh, GDP measured by uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, for 2030, he estimates that China will account for one third of the global economy. America, you see, is 15%, EU 13%. Second biggest will be, nine, will be India, 90%. 90%. Of course, India and China are the two key components in, term, in population terms uh, of the Eurasian uh, landmass. So we're talking about not just the landmass, but we're talking about a huge global shift. Now, uh, uh, of course, a project of this scale, a project of this, project of this ambition is going to face uh, enormous problems. Um, and uh, there, I think there, will, there are bound to be uh, some really serious difficulties. So let's just, I just want to run through some of the questions that we ought to have in our minds in relationship to this. Firstly, the truth is that many of these projects are probably not, at least on financial terms, are going to fail. I mean, the Chinese are putting up uh, $46 billion uh, for the uh, Pakistan-China economic corridor. I would think that a large part of that, the Pakistanis will never be able to pay off. Um, and I think in Central Asia, um, uh, the projects will, by and large, maybe 30% of those will never get uh, uh, paid off. In other words, crucial to the whole project, project, the BRI project, is Chinese largesse. Probably China will be required to put up something like $15 billion a year, maybe. Uh, maybe a bit less. That requires the Chinese economy to be con continuing to be as successful as it's been so far in order to sort of underpin these developments. Now, in some countries, sure, the, they'll be able to pay up and it won't be a great problem and so on. But in, 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 some, in some cases, I think that definitely won't be the case. So tremendous onus on China and potentially a big burden uh, for China. And if things go wrong, then it's going to have an impact on the Chinese economy uh, itself. Um, another problem, and that is uh, headwinds presented by countries who are not keen on the idea. Um, the most important example, I think, in the Eurasian landmass is India. Uh, India is, is, is slightly involved, slightly committed, as, it, as the a corridor earlier I showed on the map indicates, but not that involved and is reluctant because of a long-standing differences uh, with uh, China. But on the whole, what is, what, what is clearly uh, uh, true is that most of the countries on the Asian part of the Eurasian landmass have signed up and are exceeding these. I think over 100 countries or something like that are supporting it. Now, the exception is Western Europe. Another exception is Western Europe. Western Europe is being... Uh, it, well, it, it varies from country to country. Greece, for example, is very keen on it. Um, Britain has been keen, isn't as keen as it was. France is not, hasn't made its mind up. Germany is, uh, you know, still has got serious qualms about it and so on. The big exception in Europe 
other 16 countries of Central and Eastern Europe have signed up to it and believe their relationship with China is probably the key uh, to uh, their future. Of course, another country that's not signed up and has taken the same position as it did towards the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is the United States. American firms are involved, but the American government, um, and, and America by and large so far, has shown perhaps the least interest uh, of virtually anyone uh, in, uh, in the project. Uh, of course, there's going, this is a very unstable part of the world. Uh, terrorism's been a big player, big factor in it, and so on. What's the, how are the Chinese going to handle that? Because they haven't, well, they've got some experience of it in Xinjiang, but they don't have a great deal of experience of this compared with them in the United States and so on. How are the, how are the, uh, uh, how are the Chinese going to deal with that? I think, I think that's going to be a, a, a big problem for them. But their argument, of course, is that what we deal ultimately with terrorism is development, is the fact that you create jobs for young people and you begin to transform the attitudes of the communities and so on. Now, I think that personally there's a lot of truth in this, but I don't think that's probably the whole picture. Anyway, the, these are some of the problems uh, that uh, China is going to face and the BRI is going to face. Now, finally, my, brings my final point, which is about uh, globalisation. Now, we know that globalisation, as conceived in the period since 1980, the sort of Anglo-Saxon model of globalisation, starting with Reagan and Thatcher, is, has now hit extremely serious problems uh, with um, uh, rejection uh, of that model, uh, strongest in the United States, to some extent also in my own country, uh, Britain, but also... Uh, um, <clears throat> a, a great deal of negativity in the, uh, the European mainland uh, and so on. Why? First of all, well, there are two key reasons. I mean, first of all, uh, is obviously sections of the population in the United States and so on have done badly during the era of globalisation. Basically, wages stagnating decade upon decade. Uh, and that's true of my own country, it's true of some of the other European countries as well. But there's another way in which globalisation, Western-style globalisation, failed. And that is that while some countries, some parts of the world, like East Asia, did really well from it, not least China, if you look at the Eurasian landmass, a lot of countries did not benefit from it. Central Asia, North Africa, and so on. So Belt and Road introduces a different model, I think, of globalisation a successor model of globalisation, rooted in not the developed world, but the developing world, where growth is much faster. The growth is a bit under 2.5%, two and a half percent, two and a half times that of the developed world uh, at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, just worthwhile bearing this in mind, in, uh, in the mid-1970s, two-thirds of global GDP was produced by the rich world, which is the West plus Japan. Um, and now, uh, actually, uh, the developing world is just ahead in terms of a bit of about 51, 52% uh, compared to the West, uh, the rich world's 48, 49%. And by 2030, the projection is little that the developing world, where, let's face it, 85% of the world's population lives as opposed to only 15% in the rich world, uh, it'll be something like two thirds uh, responsible, uh, two-thirds of global GDP, GDP will come from the developing uh, world. So this is a, a very, this is a, a very new way of thinking. And, uh, and uh, it root, the, the, the next stage of globalisation would transform the world as opposed to transforming a limiting part uh, of the world. Another aspect of BRI is that Hitherto, this, this, this model of globalisation, to some extent earlier globalisation, was essentially a maritime phenomenon. Uh, it, it was the sea routes that were the transformative element uh, in terms of trade and so on. Uh, with this, the, 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 the BRI, then it's, this is going to be a new model where the land routes will be in many ways probably as important uh, as the sea routes. So it'll, that'll be another uh, difference. Now, uh, another aspect 
I think, of uh, the impact of this uh, model of globalization or this transformation uh, is going to be um, uh, what I'll call political in the sense that uh, one of the great failures of this era of globalization that we've witnessed so far is I think that there's a, gov a governance deficit in large parts of the world, not least in the Eurasian landmass. Not in the western part of the world, not in the China. China can never be accused of having a, a, a governance deficit. Um, but, uh, uh, but for many, uh, many countries, uh, they are, you know, they, they are undergoverned and, and institutions are weak and so on. I think this era of BRI could see a major transformation in this governance deficit towards something uh, rather different. I think also we'll see linked to that um, a, a, a rapid multiplying of institutions of all lots of different kinds. I mean, if you're going to have this kind of transformation, which is based on uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, cooperation between countries, China obviously being central to most of them, if not all of them, then there's going to be lots of new institutions. Um, and, you know, ASEAN plus one is a, uh, the, with the Chinese cooperation, or ASEAN plus three, uh, is, a, is, is one of the elements, one of the models, I think, uh, for what we're likely to see in the future in the Eurasian landmass. The other point, and the final point I want to make is this. Uh, I think it's inconceivable that if this project is, you know, even moderately successful, let alone uh, hugely successful, then the whole notion of polity, of what polities mean on the Eurasian landmass, is going to be transformed. It, it, it's just inconceivable that you could get these levels of cooperation um, if it happens. If you get these levels of cooperation, this kind of economic transformation on a landmass which accounts for two thirds of the world's population, that the, 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 the way in which government is conceived now compared with what it will be in the future uh, will be profoundly. Uh, different. And I think the change, if it's successful, will be far greater than any of the changes we saw during the Western era of globalization, which started in 1980 up until the present day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for that. Fascinating and a lot to talk about. I want to start by asking you, you, you're clearly optimistic at some level about the potential for the BRI. You also pointed to some really daunting potential challenges. And I'm wondering, how, sh how do you think we should evaluate whether this initiative succeeds or fails, or in real time, is succeeding or, or is not succeeding? Well, I think the crucial question is economic. I think that the bottom line here is development. I think the Chinese are right about this. Um, after all, you know, if you were discussing China, the key question in China's transformation since 1980 has been economic. All the other possibilities that we talk about are a result of that. So if this project succeeds in transforming the economic circumstances of many countries across the Eurasian landmass, it, it has to be a success. And it will transform the, form the politics, the culture, and everything else in the process. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in asking you about that cultural dimension you just alluded to. There's a part of the BRI that has been somewhat less reported upon, which is, as you know, focused on educational exchange, cultural exchange. I'm curious to ask you, how do you see that fitting into the vision you, you've presented? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, Certainly, uh, as you probably are aware, I mean, China's, um, China has opened its universities and, uh, uh, and, it, and, and its coffers uh, to many students uh, and, uh, 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 to come and be educated in Chinese universities and so on. Um, and 
I think that, that from all over the place, actually. I mean, you go to a Chinese university, it varies from university to university, but there's a, there's a hell of a lot of foreigners there. Um, and the foreigners are not, are not, by and large, Westerners. They are from all, all sorts of countries. Um, the, the, what, the one exception tends to be India. Not, not so many from India, but, but, but also many, 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 many different countries around the world. And I think that... Uh, I think that the cultural interaction between China and these other countries, these other cultures, is going to be absolutely fundamental to this process. Mm. Now, I don't think that, in one sense, I think the Chinese don't have much experience of this uh, because, you know, they've been enclosed in China until, let's say, the turn of the century. And it's only recently they've turned out with this kind of extraordinary efflorescence. Um, but in another sense, I think that China, you know, I, I've written about this in my book, I mean, it, China is also very diverse. You know, it, okay, over 90% think of themselves as Han, but historically, you can see very vividly that China is, in many respects, a multiracial country. Um, so they, it's not, and Chinese history uh, also is an illustration uh, of this. Um, their relationship with uh, the, the northern steppes, their relationship with uh, other countries in the region, and so on. So I think that um, I think this this is going to be a very intense process. Mm. Thank you. Another question that that I was thinking about as you were speaking was you talked about the problem in developing countries of a governance deficit. You even talked about the BRI as a potential source of a certain transfer or transfusion of a governance idea or governance models. I'm curious to hear you say more about that, and in particular, whether you mean by that that those countries in their forms of governance will begin to look more like China, uh, or if you mean something else. Good question. Um, I think that... Uh, I don't think that, uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, take Ethiopia, okay, I know that's not, well, Africa they do regard as part of Belt and Road, right. but uh, Ethiopia is probably the country closest to China uh, in Africa, and the most important uh, recipient of Chinese aid. And there, there's no doubt that there's been a certain amount of imitation of China, uh, politically, and right. so on. But that's an unusual case. So that's very exceptional because I can't think of another country that easily fits into that. I don't expect... Uh, so I don't expect um, other countries to start modelling themselves particularly on China, although there will be that effect. I mean, you know, that happened before, didn't it? Japan, Vietnam, Korea. I mean, they, they, they modelled themselves on China historically... In, in, in bygone, uh, bygone age, and still do. You can still see it. It's still apparent. Um, I, uh, but I think it'll be... I think they will... You know, I think they will learn the importance of development. I think they will learn the importance... that The state will become a more important institution, as it is a very important institution in China. It doesn't mean the state is very big in China. It's not actually that big, but it's extremely effective. And I think that... that I think there'll be a, there could be a borrowing of that kind. Hmm. Um, I don't expect them to, I mean, clearly some of the, I mean, clearly if you, if you get this kind of transformation, there's going to be a completely new fluidity across the continent, you know, because you're saying, well, will it be part of, China, part of China? No, I don't think it would be part of China. But, you know, in a way, China is quite a lattice-like country, lattice-like country mm -hmm. itself. And so I can see that sort of extension uh, taking place. Mm. Uh, and historically, there is, let's face it, there is a, 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 a sort of uh, example of it, which was the tributary system. Now, I don't expect that to happen. And I think that, by the way, the tributary system has been, by and large, incorrectly written, written about, uh, in, uh, 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 about what it was. But it's certainly, China, China has, the, 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 all the relationships across the continent will be, you know, they'll, they'll be, a, you know, just like, there was a turning to America in the heyday right. of, of the United States. Of course there was, because America was the centre. America was so important, and so on. There's going to be, across the, the, the landmass, a turning towards China. 
and it, it, it'll and it's going to get much stronger than we've seen so far because China is going to get much more important than it is now. Okay. Thank well, you. So I think that with that, we have to wrap up this session. There's so much more I wish I could ask you. Um, but thank you so much. And please, let's give Martin another round of applause.